So what are some of the very earliest childhood memories that you have? Now I'm not talking about stories, favorite stories that have been handed down by family members. You know those aunts that love to tell these funny stories about you when you were a little child and you've heard these stories so many times that you somehow think you remember them actually happening. No, I'm talking about actual events. How far back does your memory go? Was it when you were three years old, maybe four, maybe five? What do you suppose some of Jesus' earliest childhood memories are? Well, I doubt that even though he was God in the flesh, that he had the ability to remember, uh, for example, the, or the uh, shepherds coming and visiting him, or maybe the wise men stopping in. He was, after all, fully human. At what point, though, did he become cognizant of his own special nature? More specifically, at what point did he begin to realize that he was no ordinary boy? At what point did he have one of those aha moments when listening to scriptures being read in the synagogue and then beginning to understand that what they were reading about was actually about him? When in his formal education did he begin to piece things together and smile, knowing that all of this was really about him? We know from Scripture that at the age of 12 years old, he already possessed a very well-developed idea that he was indeed different from all the other 12-year-old boys. You'll remember the story of Mary and Joseph, how they took Jesus 12-year-old Jesus, to Jerusalem for the, for the annual Feast of the Passover. And while traveling back home, back to Nazareth, Mary and Joseph begin to look for Jesus, and they discover that he is nowhere to be seen among family and friends. And so they went back to Jerusalem, and they searched all over the city looking for him, and they finally found him in, in the courts of the temple. And he's seated there very calmly, very peacefully, talking with the leaders, the, the teachers of the law. Now, visibly shaken from the experience, mom scolds him for not staying with the group, to which Jesus replied, why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Twelve years old. <laughs> Can you imagine that? What does this tell us about what Jesus understood about who he was. How long was it that he possessed this kind of knowledge? At what point did he, did he figure this out? Was he six years old, maybe eight years old, maybe 10 years old? This is one of those stories there in the temple that I would love to be able to go back in time and be a fly in the wall and, and listen to the dialogue that's going on between 12-year-old Jesus and these very learned men who were in the temple courts. Luke records for us that he, that he sat among the teachers, and I think that's a significant little phrase. He sat with them, and he was listening and asking them questions. Jesus was a good listener even as a boy. Later, as a rabbi, he honed his skills as one who used questions effectively to reach out to people. The people around who were watching all this go on were amazed at, at his understanding and his answers. So can you picture, can you picture the teachers periodically exchanging glances with one another and then thinking to themselves, who is this boy? Who is he? As a 12-year-old, he already had a pretty firm grasp on who he was. And so, what were some of the questions that he was asking the teachers of the law? Can I venture a guess here? Here's what I think. I suspect he was asking them very specific questions about what was written in the scriptures about the coming Messiah, about the anointed one, about 
the Christ. Remember, too, that this was 18 years before he was immersed by John the baptizer and he began his ministry among the people. We often speculate that during those 18 years, um, he worked with his father in, in the carpentry business. And that probably was true, I'm guessing. But I believe that Jesus probably spent a lot of his time preparing himself for the work that was ahead of him. That would have involved a lot of time reading the scriptures, familiarizing himself with the very things that prior to his coming to earth as a baby, uh, he, would have, he would have known very intimately and been aware of them and personally involved from his perspective in heaven. Now, if there's one thing that the Gospels do, more than anything else, it's to set the record straight of who Jesus is, the identity of Jesus. This was the priority of, of each of the four Gospel writers. It's to answer this one question. Who is this man? Who is he? To do this, the Gospel writers draw heavily on the writings of the Scriptures. That is, the law and the prophets the Jewish books of history and poetry. And they all have one common theme, to point forward to the coming Messiah. And that is why we frequently read in the Gospels a statement that indicates that something that was said or done was done in order to fulfill the prophecy. Growing up in church, I remember some, some very good teachers that I had saying things like, the new is in the old concealed, and the old is in the new revealed. Now, I believe we can easily say this. Christ is found everywhere in the old concealed. And the full meaning of the old can only be found as Christ is revealed in the new. So, just who is this man? The world of a young handmaiden from Nazareth was, was turned upside down when an angel showed up on her doorstep telling her about a son that she was going to have. You talk about an, the ultimate gender reveal. Not only did this angel reveal to her that she was going to have a baby boy, but this boy was going to be something special. According to Luke's account, as he describes it, there are at least eight things Mary would learn about her son-to-be. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. He will be identified as the Holy One. He will be called the Son of God. Now, when you think about it, that's a pretty impressive list about an unborn baby that is yet to be conceived. Not too many expectant mothers are given this kind of insight as to what their offspring is going to be like. And by the way, nine months later, that's Mary there with the big grin on her face the night that her son was born. Never mind the fact that, that he was born in a barn. Recalling the angelic visit, she knew that this baby was something special. You see, he is the fulfillment of what the prophet Isaiah would say in his, in his scripture words. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. That is, God with us. At the start of his ministry, Jesus lined up with the multitude of people who were waiting to be immersed by John the baptizer. Now, to the average person in line, Jesus probably was nothing out of the ordinary. He, he wore the same kind of clothing as everyone else, and he had the same Jewish look. Nothing really set him apart, which, which they could see on the surface. He was simply waiting his turn, just like everyone else. And then came the moment when he stepped into the waters. Something happened that rocked the hearts and minds of everyone present. And as he came up out of the water, a dove floated down from the sky and, and landed on him, a sign 
that the Holy Spirit was resting upon him. And then something even more extraordinary. A voice comes forth from the heavens. This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Imagine the impact that must have had on, on John the Baptist, on all those who would have been there in that moment. Who is this man? Who is this man? And at this point, it's God saying to them, this is my son. This would not be the last time a heavenly voice would affirm the identity of Jesus. When he was transfigured on the mountain, Three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, heard this exact same declaration repeated once again, only with one slight variation, according to Matthew. This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And then he tacks on this little statement, which I'm sure was for their benefit. Listen to him. <laughs> Listen to him. It's, way, it's God's way of confirming the identity of his son the Messiah, this is my son. I want you to listen to him, whatever you do. To have this heavenly proclamation declared not only once, but twice would be impressive enough on its own. But it's the words that God spoke in that moment that, that we must take note of. In a psalm inspired by the Holy Spirit and given to David, it's the second psalm. We find the Old Testament sources of what God wanted Jesus' followers to know and to understand. Psalm 2-7 says this, I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I've become your father. Now the New Testament writers certainly understood this statement as obviously a messianic reference to the one who is coming to the anointed one in preaching the gospel message of Christ the apostle Paul proclaimed this we tell you the good news what God promised our fathers he has fulfilled for us their children by raising up Jesus as it is written in the second psalm you are my son today I have become your father you see this was a fulfillment not about David, ultimately, but about Jesus. As we read story after story about Jesus in Scripture, there's one common thread that keeps coming back time and again. His identity is clearly rooted in the pages of the prophecies. Over and over we read and find the answer to the question, Who is this man? It's linked to the words found in the Scriptures of what the Jews would, would call their scriptures and what we call the Old Testament. Who is this man? Is a frequent refrain heard throughout the life and ministry of Jesus. When Jesus calms the storm, his disciples cry out in fear, Who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? Well, according to the psalmist, he is the one who stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. When the Lord forgave the sins of the paralytic, the Pharisees chastised him, saying, Who is this that blasphemes? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Who is this man? Well, according to the prophet Isaiah, he is the one that fulfills the words of God. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remember your sins no more. When the Pharisees questioned the blind man about being healed by Jesus, they asked him, how did he open your eyes? Which, in my opinion, is just another way of saying, who is this guy? But had they known God's intention for his anointed, they would have understood the words of the prophet Isaiah when he said, then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Who is this man hanging on the cross? It is the very same one spoken of by the psalmist who wrote these very, very important words in Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their head. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. A band of evil men have encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. Sound familiar? Just who is this man? Do you know him? Have, have you read his back story? You see, Jesus is no Johnny come lately. He is not an afterthought. He is not, he is not leftovers of a plan gone bad. His story is woven into the tapestry of God's message of hope and love found throughout the pages of the Old Testament narrative. Not surprising, it's Jesus who said it best to his two downcast followers, disciples on the road to Emmaus. And they are so down and he comes up and he talks to them. Listen to what he says. How foolish you are. And how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Who is this man? Great question. Do you know? Do you know who he is? Do you understand his backstory? Do you understand that everything that he said and he did was all accounted for in the scriptures prior to him even showing up? By answering this question, who is this man? It leads us to the answer of our own identity. Who am I? Who am I? I am a child of the king. Who are you, my friend? Who are you? If you can say with certainty that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and if you give yourself to him, you can know your story is tied with his because you will be a child of the King. Pray with me. Father, thank you for loving us and revealing to us your Son. Thank you for the words of the prophets, for the words of Moses and David, for the words of so many who spoke about the coming anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ, Jesus, our Lord. Lord, help us to have eyes to see and ears to hear that Jesus is our Savior. We pray this in his name. Amen.